Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of PsyCafe, brought for, uh, to you by Kaus Research. Welcome to the people who are joining us online, and welcome as well to the people who join us here in person. Uh, my name is Sara Durini. I am a scientific editor in the research communication team, and today I'm going to be your moderator. So today's event is a bit different from uh, the usual Psycafe because it's organized in partnership with WEP, Winter Enrichment Program. And uh, the topic, uh, the theme of uh, this year's WEP is the edge. So our panelists today are going to share their experience on how they brought the sport they are passionate about uh, to their edge. Before starting, I just want to give you a quick recap about the format. We are going to hear about our panelists for us, uh, first, and then it's time for you to ask questions. So get ready, prepare your question, don't be shy, and remember that there are no wrong questions. So that said, I think that we can start. And uh, we can start from you, Pierre. Please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your sport. Okay. Uh, I'm Pierre Magistretti. Uh, I am a neuroscientist. I joined KAUST uh, 11 years ago, almost by the day. Uh, I am a vice president for research and director of the Smart Health Initiative. And before that, I was for eight years dean of BSc. Um, and uh, yeah, I study brain, brain energy metabolism in particular, how the brain um, uh, provides uh, and regulates its uh, energy consumption. My sport uh, is golf. Uh, I started quite young, and um, I'll tell you more about when uh, uh, Sarah asks. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we will ask you. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, your turn. Tell us a bit about yourself and about your sport. Thanks, thanks, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here again. Uh, yeah, my name is Martin Mai. I am at KAUST since June 2009, <laughs> so, so that makes it 13.8 <laughs> years or something like this. I'm uh, a KAUST founding faculty member, one of the thir about 30 uh, who are still at KAUST. Uh, my research in is in earthquake physics mostly, so we, un we try to understand through data and simulations how earth the earthquake machine works, how earthquakes are produced in the Earth's crust, how they radiate seismic waves, how they may generate tsunamis and the related damage and, uh, you know, uh, to buildings and to infrastructures and try to quantify the seismic hazard associated to it. We have also the additional research theme here at KAUST on geothermal energy, which we think provides a very useful and important renewable energy source, in particular along the Red Sea shores, where geothermal energy is abundant but we haven't fully explored yet that um, opportunity. And so we have a team here at KAUST together with the Enperg Center to work on that. Um, now, the second question is my sport. Um, and I should say it's not one sport, it is a sequence of different types of sports that I did and pursued. So as many young kids, boys, I played soccer for a long time in a team where a few players became really famous that I played with as a teenager. There was a team in Germany, and my goalkeeper was Oliver Kahn, who was the, the one of the famous goalkeepers in the early, uh, late 90s, uh, early 2000s. Um, then I switched from football into climbing and mountaineering, which actually occupied me for about a decade or more, and mm -hmm. we went through all over Europe, go climbing and, you know, uh, rock climbing and summiting uh, big mountains. And eventually I got actually attracted into more endurance sports, um, running, biking, swimming, which adds up to triathlon. And uh, I'll tell a bit more about this. Thank later. you very much. Mm -hmm. And today we have a guest from outside Kaust. Uh, Raha, do you want <coughs> to tell us a bit about yourself and about your sport? Thank you so much. Happy to be here. I'm not a scientist, unfortunately, but I'm a science lover. So I hope that counts. Um, does, sorry if I'm going to repeat myself again. For those of you who attended my talk, thank you. But I'm going to introduce for those new faces. My name is Ram Harrag. I'm from Saudi. Um, a few years ago, I decided to do something completely crazy and climb the highest mountains in the world. At the time, it wasn't really... Uh, what girls do or what guys do, actually. <laughs> no one used to do this. But I decided to, 
to teach myself and to improve as an athlete. And in the process, I started climbing the seven summits, and one of them was Everest, you know, little mountain in the Himalayas. And that kind of changed my life and put me in the map as a pioneer in sports in the region. And I think that's how I found my edge. A lot of people don't know that I have always been an athlete. I've always been sporty. I play, I, I swam, I, I scuba dive, I horseback ride, I play volleyball. I do all of these sports, but my, my true passion came out when I did mountaineering. And Besides the, liter the, lit the actual literal edge of the mountains, <laughs> the, the emotional, mental, and psychological um, edge you reach when you, when, you when you climb is just incredible. And the thing that connects all three sports, if, if you notice, is mental strength and mental aptitude. So really excited to discuss and share as well more about myself later. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's so exciting to have you here. Uh, Pierre, let's get back to you. Um, my first question is, how did you become passionate about golf? Like, why did you start it? What was your inspiration or motivation? Um, well, it started when I joined um, a boarding school in, Sw in the Swiss Alps mm -hmm. uh, when I was uh, 11. Uh, and uh, I this, the b this boarding school was in a... Uh, as I like to call it, a uh, Scottish oasis in the Alps. <laughs> uh, there, is, there are two superb golf courses there, and essentially everybody plays golf. I, when I was a child, I used to play, you know, with the, with the, um, the priest, the postman. Yeah. I mean, everybody. Sorry to everybody. interrupt. I think that we are seeing now some okay. photos. This was <laughs> you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, so, um, uh, so the. It became natural to to to, to play golf. People play golf in the summer and spring, and uh, ski in the winter. So mm -hmm. that's what I did for a few years. I also studied on the side, actually. <laughs> but <laughs> I did a lot of golf, uh, and um, my family actually already played some golf. So anyway, I and it started like um, you know, for some reason, I was relatively rapidly quite good. I mean, for my age. And I started winning uh, some, getting rewards. In mm -hmm. other words, I was trained, play well, win local uh, competitions, then regional, then eventually uh, national, and, and that's where I ended up uh, for uh, in the m l a bit later uh, when I was in the, my uh, early 20s for uh, four or five years to play for the Swiss national golf team. I played. Uh, European championships, uh, various national uh, matches, uh, and so on. So, uh, my passion came by mm, a little bit by family, but by chance, bec by the situation, mm -hmm. and because you know, I guess when you things work and and you get rewards, you kind of continue, and that's how it became a passion. Nice, very interesting. Thank you, uh, Martin. What about you? How did you start your uh, how your passion for these outdoor sports started? Was what mm -hmm. was your motivation? Yeah, so for me, with mountaineering and climbing, there was sort of com you know, coming from the family. Um, we went as a family to the Swiss mountains, so just hiking and Again, hiking around. And eventually, my mother said, "Why don't you?" go to take some climbing courses. So it's actually the fault of my mother that I came into climbing. And I just loved it to be outdoors, to have really good friends that you rely on, you build trust with, because they have to belay you when you climb. And uh, so we ended up just touring across Europe for, for several years in my late teenage, early 20s, to just climb you know, difficult cliffs, summit the tops and so on. And uh, there was just a picture of, of us uh, somewhere in southern France um, doing that. Eventually, climbing became a bit more, uh, like, too popular for me. Um, it, it became too organized. There were competitions, um, and climbing gyms open, and, and there were just a lot of people around the climbing um, areas that were not sort of my outdoor adventure kind of folks. And uh, so I gravitated away to start actually more cycling and, and triathlon just by virtue of people who I met. Mm -hmm. And I got excited about doing this. And uh, there was a, uh, on the slide another picture of me uh, cycling somewhere. And, and these are like very old pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So don't look too closely. We were young Can we see the, the, yeah, the photo again? Oh, and wow. And through my cycling, I actually came also to uh, do more uh, long 
term long distance mountain bike um, travel. Where, uh, where was he? So this one, this picture is taken uh, in Yemen in 1991. And I was with my mountain bike in Yemen, Egypt, and Jordan for about four months or five months. Mm -hmm. So traveling by myself. And you know, you have all your gear, you have your tent, your sleeping bag, your kicking and whatever, and you just go around. And so I, I did that in Yemen, I did this in India and in Nepal, in the Himalayas. So it's that combination of endurance sports, adventure travel, um, you push yourself, you push your own limits, you come to the physical edges of top cliffs, but you also can, you know, you develop your own edges of how far you can push yourself in any given situation. And and uh, it's more so, so it's not so the compet competition with others. It's the competition with yourself, and you know, testing what you can do and who you are. Mm -hmm. This really kept me going in this context. Thank you, Martin. That's a very interesting path <laughs> that you followed. Uh, Raha, what about you? Your motivation, your inspiration. When when did it started? I think I've always wanted to be an adventure athlete kind of character or personality. I never imagined it would manifest into mountaineering. But the question is, why mountaineering? And uh, again, sorry if I'm repeating myself, but the fastest way to get me to do something is tell me I cannot do it. <laughs> so the reason why I picked mountaineering and I picked mountains is because so many, pe so many people were, were doubting me and they were telling me, you can't climb, you're Saudi, you're a girl, and all of these naysayers and negativity. So that was the reason why I decided to go with mountaineering. But why these t sports? Because I think it just speaks to me in a, in a, in a way that nothing else does. Um, like you mentioned, I like to compete in a, in a deeper sense, not with others, but with myself. And um, I fell in love with being able to, to pick a goal, however crazy, and some of them were crazy, and to just decide and to go for it. And that's where the, the, the passion came from. I wanted to be a better version of who I am. I also wanted to prove people wrong <laughs> a little bit because who doesn't want to change the stereotype? Who doesn't want to prove people right in a good way? So in all honesty, it's because I was told I couldn't do it and I didn't like that. No one should tell you what you can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. And I, I was at your talk today and I find really interesting and also cute the way you started. Like your first uh, peak was, uh, was Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro. Yeah. And uh, I had no idea what exactly it was. Exactly. You <laughs> Zero. I, I remember that you mentioned that and I was like, it's incredible. Yeah. Zero. And, but, but you went for it. Yes, I, but I, I went for it. I wasn't ready and I, I paid for it miserably. <coughs> and that was the last time I was unprepared for any mountain. So I took it as a lesson. I got <laughs> badly beaten up on the mountain and I'm like, that's it. I'm going to be the best mountaineer, the most equipped, and I'll never be weak and cold again. And, and that's how I decided to, to go climb. I went a little bit crazy. I did all seven and like 14 others, but like <laughs> I just, <laughs> it was um, believing that I could do something that almost no one believed I could. Amazing. That's very inspiring. Thank you. Um, Pierre, my last, my next question is how, and for you all as well, how do you think that uh, sport helped you to push your limits and take sport and maybe your professional life as well to the edge? How this 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 helped? Well, <coughs> um, at least I can speak for uh, for golf, the sports mm -hmm. I, I I I practiced. Uh, uh, I think um, it it you you need. Uh, I mean, it it brings out some let's say aptitudes, maybe qualities, mm -hmm. uh, which um, uh, you need to to be good at what you do. In a way, probably. Uh, in every field, but certainly in, in golf, you need um, a combination uh, of being uh, very focused, uh, very um, put a lot of concentration on what you are doing at, at the moment, and at the same time being relaxed <laughs> and calm. And you know, it's uh, two, uh, um, uh, two in a way contrasting uh, qualities or aptitudes or attitudes also. Uh, which, you know, I in a way, I think, uh, are helpful, uh, you know, th they became part of my life, at least that's what I try. When I do one thing, I do it very uh, intensely, but at the same time, I try to be relaxed. And also as a scientist, you need to be as focused. As a scientist, uh, uh, yeah, it's the same, uh, uh, you know, you have to be, uh, um, I think, a a a agile uh, mentally as mm -hmm. a scientist. You must be persistent. 
so and focused, but at the same time be ready to, you know, be again relaxed enough to be able to adapt and and change. So uh, I think these are, in a way, as I said, contrasting uh, uh, qualities, but uh, they they are important to coexist. I think if you want to to achieve, uh, you know, a certain number of things, including sports play play well golf <laughs> thank you uh, martin what do you think what uh, how sport helped you to push your limits and uh, arrive to the edge yeah I mean, as pierre says i mean sport and being good in some sort of sport requires focus um, dedication discipline um and you know a way to plan your life, your days around being you know, able to do the sports. Um, so this perseverance that you develop definitely helps you in your professional life. I mean, sometimes you just have to hang on there, push through. The results are not coming in as quickly as we hope. Um, the sport I did or do seems m often to be like a solitary sport. You run by yourself or you bike by yourself. However, we often you do this also in, in a group, in a team. Um, in particular, climbing, um, you, you climb with a partner, or partners usually, uh, who, who belay you, unless you're the really crazy guys who do the free <laughs> solo, um, t absolutely at the edge. Um, and, and so th with these people, you build a very deep bond, very, very deep trust, because literally your life depends on these. And, and again, this is something I think that translates into professional life where you have to build deep trusts uh, with people, with your mentors, with your mentees, with your students, postdocs, really to achieve something um, and, and, and bring the best results out of, of the individual. Um, so I, th I think what what I we take from sports ha uh, applies in many ways to what we do, who we are in science as well. And then for me, typically, not, I mean, in, in my current daily life, um, it adds to the component that the sports helps me to relax mentally. The keeps you know physical strength. It keeps a psychological strength, but it does help also to relax mentally. So as, as you know, many people know, I go out here on campus, you know, almost every day, and it's kind of dump everything that happened on the day during the day, on the road, free my mind t to other activities and keep you know mensana in corpora sana mm -hmm. to actually you know <coughs> embrace the two. <coughs> Raha, I see you're smiling and... Because yeah. they're making you're my job so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree with them I, to build on both points. Uh, especially, I think, mountaineering or any sport that's, that, uh, that, that's mental, it really, really teaches you how to control the one thing you only have control over, which is yourself. So in many, many situations in my mountain history, when we're stuck and it's minus 45 and you, you're stuck in the tent and it's a horrible tent and you haven't showered for God knows how long and you didn't, the last time you ate that isn't out of the bag was two months ago and everyone's upset and everyone's tired and the weather is horrible. You can only control yourself and that's a skill set that I try to take in all aspects of my life from getting angry in the road <laughs> because I can't control it to personal strifes in, in my personal life. So mountaineering has really, really taught me how to, to just take a deep breath, <laughs> take it inside and, and to control the emotions and also how to deal with teammates and how to deal with different walks of life and different backgrounds. I was, I was saying this today, everyone's really nice and happy <laughs> when, when you're showered hung and not hungry, comfortable, everyone is nice. Mm -hmm. But when you strip away your comfort, when you strip away the human um, plushness of your daily life, the true character comes out. And if you don't know how to handle yourself, your own monster and other people's monsters, it's horrible. So really mountaineering has taught me people skills from zero. I, like we say, it taught me people st skills from, from, from 101 and also to be patient and to be understanding and to work with others, even if you have different in backgrounds and this is the one of the best lessons I've, I've experienced. In addition to picking good water to boil, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Learning how to deal with people and with yourself is an amazing skill for life. 
Okay, seems like very important lessons to, to learn. Absolutely. Um, I have a question for the two scientists, which is um, being a sports person sometimes helps you build these skills that are very helpful also as a scientist. And uh, one of the things is that sometimes when you're dealing with sport, you have to deal with failure, right? How do you do that? And also, as a scientist as well, it's something that sometimes you have to go through. Uh, how difficult it is, how can you go over it? Pierre, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, failure is uh, part of uh, life, of uh, every activity. And certainly uh, um, uh, in sports, uh, at least at the competitive level, that, uh, that happens. I mean, you suddenly for some reason uh, uh, you, you don't you don't score well because mm -hmm. of, of and so uh, the important thing is to to be persistent I think and uh, uh, you know don't get put off by by a failure and just uh, never give up really <laughs> somewhere and and, and, and and continue and um, you can learn from failure also and so maybe you uh, change your training, uh, you work more uh, a given shot. Uh, again, I speak about golf. Mm -hmm. Now, for science, um, you know, <laughs> a lot of the experiments we do, at least, <laughs> don't work. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to, <laughs> to accept this. And uh, you have to understand why, and that you then progress. progress. So, uh, I c again, I think failure is part of any activity. You just have to, to accept it, work hard, and uh, in terms of in the science also, and I mentioned this a bit earlier, you, okay, you have to be persistent, but also agile at the same time. You have to understand when maybe you, <laughs> you should change something uh, and not, for example, keep on doing uh, the same experiment, Ch change, uh, same for, for sports. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, I would say, this is my general comment about uh, failure and, and frustration, but always keep the drive. Thank you. Uh, Martin? What's your opinion? What do you think about failures, how to deal with it, how hard it is, uh, both as a sportsman and as a scientist? Yeah, as Pierre said, failure is part of life. Uh, it's awfully painful. <laughs> um, and then you ask yourself, so, so what happened? Is it my mistake? Or were the boundary conditions, the, uh, the environmental conditions not right mm -hmm. at that moment? So, and, and following up what Raha said, you know, which part is under my control and which part is something, something that I have to accept, which is beyond my control, and could I have prepared better? Um, so, so I, I'll just give a quick personal example. Uh, a long time ago, I was training for Ironman and was in a race. And uh, I basically had to bail out about an hour into being at the finish line. So I was geared up for a 9.30 or so time, 9 hours, 30 minutes to finish the Ironman. But I couldn't run straight anymore. I was hallucinating, right? And I decided to quit. And it was probably right from a medical point of view, right? <laughs> but this haunted me for months, right? And because you put so much effort into me preparing for an Ironman yeah. and, and you're on track and then you're almost at the finish line and you decide to give up. And so there were, you know, let's say mistakes in the preparation and mistakes during the race. But then it was a particularly hot day, so I just couldn't take in the fluids that I needed, whatever. So there were both factors I could control. There were factors that were out of my control. But then from that defeat, I call it, um, I kind of learned what, what Pierre was saying, you know, just accept it, it happens, next time you prepare better, you take your little lessons from it, you learn, and uh, then progress. And in science, it's the very same thing, you may prepare for an experiment from, for, for weeks or months, and it just doesn't work, and you, for a while, you don't understand why it is. And then suddenly you find, okay, here it might be the, the bits of pieces of, of knowledge I might even extract from a failed experiment, right? Or we go out in the field, install instruments, um, you know, actually invest quite a bit of time, people, money, <coughs> and so on, and the data are just bad, 
Okay, so, well, it happens, but that's part of science, right? And so I think the, the lessons we learn from sports and from these personal activities are very applicable to science and both make us, you know, a, you know how to say, more broadly educated or more broadly aware uh, personalities. Thank you, Martin. Um, Raha, don't forget to tell them he went back and <laughs> finished the marathon after that. So oh, I did, yeah. <laughs> bravo. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So <laughs> bravo. I, I was hoping that maybe we would go on with that <laughs> and then saying that, yeah, you finished the triathlon and the triathlon. it was amazing. successful. <laughs> what about you, Raha? Did you have to deal with failures? How do you do that? What, which lesson did you learn? Oh, absolutely. I think, um, I think a lot of people are afraid to fail. But in truth, it's a fact of life. It's a price you have to pay. And there's no shame in failing. The only shame is in not giving, getting up and not trying. I would rather fail 100 times than not try at all. Because to me, I would rather be a person that tries and see where it goes. And you choose whether or not the, the failure is the beginning or an end. Mm -hmm. And always choose for it to be a beginning. Let it be a lesson. Let it be a moral, let it be a purpose, let it be something that helps you, propel you. He learned from his last mistake and he improved himself last time. So you can choose whether or not the failure burns and bites and is lasting and then it's <coughs> just a painful thing or it's a turning point and a positive thing to, to learn from the mistake and to learn. There are some failures that are inevitable and very difficult and not uh, very bitter, mm -hmm. but then again, everything has a silver lining. That's great. I like the all the positivity that comes from such a difficult Well, during question. when you're failing, the truth is it feels horrible <laughs> and that's <laughs> normal and it's ac accept that. Don't pre I'm not pretending that it's not easy, but after 2-3 weeks of recovering, look back and see if there's something you can learn from it. Okay, it still sounds positive. Thank you. <laughs> I try to be positive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, there is an interesting thing that I noticed when I when I was chatting with you. Like in sport, like I'm not a, a sport person, but um, and I always think that to excel in sport or even in, in life, in your career, sometimes you need to be talented. But uh, talking to you, I also realized that maybe uh, discipline is maybe have the same importance or maybe more important than, than talent, no? Pierre, Absolutely. what do you think? Absolutely. Discipline and hard work. Sounds not very exciting, but I think there is no other way that uh, to succeed again at a high level. And in fact, um, yeah, if I take my own experience, uh, I really um, played uh, a lot during my t uh, teenage period. In fact, my, my father used to ask me, how is your hobby <laughs> speaking about school? <laughs> <laughs> because I was... <laughs> I was mostly spending time hitting balls on the driving range, chipping, putting, and playing on the course. So uh, you may have, I mean, I guess if you have some sort of talent, it may, it's helpful. But uh, the most important uh, way to achieve uh, something uh, at a competitive level is discipline. Yeah, because I remember you said you started uh, with golf when you was when you were very young. I was yeah, so and you were going, 11, yeah, you were yeah. training basically almost every day. Yeah, I was playing uh, almost every day. Yes. Wow. So yeah, that's. <laughs> and then actually, uh, when I really was at the competitive level, I was uh, in medical school at the time. Mm -hmm. So that was <laughs> even more challenging because I had to attend a few yeah. lectures here and there. <laughs> <laughs> <But> <laughs> In your free time, attending free les <laughs> uh, some lessons. <laughs> uh, Martin, what do you think? S sorry, the, the general question. Oh, yeah, sorry. It was about how important uh, discipline is when it comes to oh, become okay. a successful sportsman. Is it more talent, right. more discipline? <coughs> I mean, let's put it this way. We all, every single one, has at least one, two, maybe three talents. And often it takes time to discover them. Um, and some talents we may have, we'd never discover. Um, and then you have to nurture them. Um, and uh, But if you don't put in the time and the effort, uh, it's not going to work. And whether you're a musician, uh, a painter, 
a runner, a golfer, whatever it is, right? Uh, photographer. So we have to practice, um, and through the practice, you know, become better. Um, the grit we need to develop, the hard work, and the perseverance is absolutely necessary to be successful. Now, as as a sort of a side fun fact regarding triathlon, for my particular case. I had no talent whatsoever. whatsoever. <laughs> I was ne never trained as a swimmer and as a teenager. I did a lot of biking mm -hmm. and some running. But the good thing about triathlon is that you have three disciplines. And if you're just about average in everything, you do well overall. Because often you have a specialist who, who came from swimming but doesn't, is not a good runner, right? Mm -hmm. Or you have a, a cyclist who doesn't know how to swim and is not a good, good runner. So sometimes it's actually useful if you're good average a bit above average in several things and then you can excel as well but you have to put in the hard work discipline um, dedication um, it, it's part of the equation absolutely and so that's the same for science um, you just have to be persistent and build that perseverance to be able to push on and mm -hmm. come to the edge Raha how do you balance this equation I, I actually see it a little bit differently to okay. most people. I believe that no one's actually born with a special <laughs> thing that <coughs> is just amazing. Yeah, some people are good at, uh, at things than others, but I believe that the only true dr discipline the human soul has is the determination and the consistency and the, the, um, the drive to want to learn something. So you can be you can be the best at something and not have the discipline. Then it it just fizzes away and it, and you will compete at a level and you won't be good at it. But if you're average at something and then you have the dis the discipline to improve it, then you can be better than someone who is gifted. But I really don't believe anyone get just gets anything, and it's it's naturally to them. It's really really rare that suddenly a four year old paints or just picks up the violin and it's very very rare everybody has the capability of being great at something but not everybody has the patience the determination the discipline and the sacrifices mm. that it takes to be good at that thing i'm not a mountaineer i grew up in jeddah like i didn't i saw ice in the fridge i didn't <laughs> experience anything like that i I used to be very pampered in, in how I grew up and no one can say that I was innately a good mountaineer but I became a good mountaineer because I put the time in and I'm not special I just had the ability to train myself I had luck in being able to deal with altitude in a really odd way well but that that's luck because I couldn't your body f f acts in a certain way but then again, if I didn't have the courage to be a mountaineer, would I have known I was a good climber? So it's a bit of both. Being able to find what you're good at, love it, put the time in that's necessary, and sacrifice and the d determination and the, dis the discipline to just be amazing at something. That's the, true, that's the true gift that I think humans have. Thank you. I really like this perspective. Thank you very much to the three of you. Um, I think it's time to give the microphone to our audience. So if you have, I, uh, I'm sure you have questions, then <laughs> we have a microphone. Um, if you just can give us one second, or otherwise I can repeat the question because we need the microphone for... I think for it's a small space, streaming. so you can just yeah, ask. Yeah, but for the, um, oh, for online. the live streaming, for the online. Online. Yeah. Yeah. we need um, to have the microphone. So yeah, there is more time for the other people in the audience to, to get ready with their questions. OK, it's arriving. Great. <laughs> Here. Is that on? Yeah, it should work. Can you please tell us your name? No, the uh, microphone yeah. is not on. It's working? Is it working? What about the cube? The cube is a microphone? The cube is a microphone, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, so the, the cube um, is the microphone that works. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. This one is working. Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much for this uh, positive vibe, I would call it, <laughs> uh, session. 
Uh, my question is uh, maybe uh, to any one of you, maybe specifically to Raha. Uh, we all have, I would say, maybe two types of uh, inner chatter or inner monkey within us. One that tells Only you. Only two? I Lucky. Mean, at least. Lucky. <laughs> at least that's what I have discovered so far. The one that tells you um, you can't do it or do not start, and the one that tells you um, do not continue. Hmm. So, were there times where you say t to yourself, "Just quit this"? What What got me into this? Were there times your body was telling you that? Um, I am exhausted. I am exhausted after a long day at Kaust. Why I am doing this to my body? Or you are just looking at um, the positive relaxation to the mind, for example, and that was worth it. So what is your take on this? You want to take we can start from Raha and then me? we can also... Yes, yes, there were many days where I woke up thinking, what am I doing here? And everything hurts. I remember even at some point, my eyelashes were hurting me from the goggles. And I'm like, I can't even close my eyes from the pain. But if I reminded myself of how lucky I was for being up there, how fortunate I am to be able to get that opportunity, I get out of my sleeping bag immediately. I just needed to remind myself that I'm doing something that pe people would dream of, that people would, would never be able sometimes to achieve. And that's how I tell myself. I ground myself. I remind myself of how fortunate I am. When I'm too tired to do something, I was telling the, the panel, I show up anyway, even if I'm exhausted, because I am so fortunate to be able to get this opportunity. That's th that, that's, that shuts up my monkeys. I remind myself, Raha, you're doing something incredible and you're just a little bit tired and you're not continuing because you didn't eat for a couple of days. Get up and do it. It's really not easy. It's, I had some horrible days, but just that reminder of the sacrifices of my parents, of my, the, the time I put my friends. If you remind yourself how lucky you are, you won't waste a single moment of your day because we are very lucky and very fortunate. Thank you. Um, Pierre, yeah, yeah, well, I can, <laughs> even though it's not physical exhaustion, uh, but mental exhaustion can, can happen. And in fact, I remember an, a, a, an, a, an anecdote. I was playing uh, in an open championship, so professional and amateur was playing with two professionals. And there was a last day and was 36 holes, so it's twice five hours, so about 10 hours. It was raining, pouring, raining. And the at the end of the day, the professionals asked me, why are you doing this? We do this to make, to make a living, but why, why, why are you doing this? And honestly, I, I, I never asked this question. I was very happy to have the opportunity to mm -hmm. play a, a tournament at that level. And um, so I guess it's, uh, it's all in the brain somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree very much. Um, you, it's, it's a matter of determination and then shutting up these monkeys. And, and I realized that over time you actually get better at, at shutting them up, those who want to s keep you in the bed or on the sofa, if you just tried a few more times to actually get up and do something. So often I, I come home from work here and of after a long day and say, do I really want to go for a short run? Oh, I could just sit there with a cup of tea on the sofa and I say, no, no, you go. And, you know, if you're a minute and a half or two minutes out there, you feel how your body stretches, how your mind relaxes. And after a 30, 40 minute run or whatever you'd want to do, you're actually a lot more energized than you are before. You sit there, you're tired, you're in your tent, it's, it's miserable, miserable conditions out there, but once you make that step and tell yourself to get up and do it. You energize yourself. It's kind of magic. It you is. have to tell us what happens in the brain <laughs> at that <laughs> process because there's something going on in the body where you're able to motivate yourself and that produces whatever chemicals in our bodies so yeah. that we actually get going and yeah. we feel better. We are more energized after the physical activity than before. Yeah. And, and once you have had this experience a few times, you're like, you get addicted. It is just 
you, and you know it works, right? It's sort of this learning experience. And then if you give in once in a while and they don't get up, it's like you really feel sluggish for a few days and you question yourself, oh, I should really should have gone. And so it's, it's this process of trying it a few mm. times and then you realize, yes, I feel beaten up. Yes, I am tired physically and mentally, but let me go out anyways, put in the determination, show up. Show up. Just show up. And you get out, you're stronger afterwards. And that lesson and experience is just very rewarding. And then you, you get better at shutting up these monkeys. Yeah, if I may comment of on, course on this. Of course, good I mean, question. you just said reward. I mean, actually, we have within our brains uh, reward systems. I mean, they are associated with representation, things that we can imagine or act that bring us a reward. Now, this may be unique to each one of us. I mean, something that is, I find rewarding, uh, you wouldn't. But there is definitely a, re a reward uh, system, many actually, that are uh, activated. And um, so uh, the, the idea actually, I, I found it very interesting that the artificial intelligence, machine learning systems, they, in the algorithms, introduce a reward. Mm. I mean, to you need you need a reward i think this is really an important component of then you can do it at any level but you have to find uh, have a reward in the built in the system and and so the reward is not a trophy and the reward is not, not necessarily a, a page a check no, after no. you won a competition a or a tournament the reward it can be a feeling the reward it can be a feeling it's a it's bodily a feeling yeah, it it's, can be a a it's a representation of yeah. something in your in your mind yeah, yeah. And and from your mind in your heart, yeah, and that basically connects you, you know, mentally, emotionally, physically, and and gives you the strength to get up from your sofa. Really good question. Yeah. 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 yeah Thank very, you for the nice. question. <laughs> Where is the cube? That's good. <laughs> yeah, the cube is there. Any more question? Oh, there. Perfect. Um, curious. So. Sorry, if you can you hear me all right? Yeah. Uh, is the cube no. working? Yeah, it is. Is it? It's okay. working. Um, I've noticed, I mean, today is an example, and many of the people that I've met here who are PIs tend to excel if they have the sports. You commented on how your, your athletics have, the discipline you learned from that has benefited your career. It's interesting to me that anecdotally, and as demonstrated here today, you all are competing in very individualistic sports. <laughs> we talked about and I'm wondering if, do you find among your peers that there are going to be athletes who are the left back of a football team or the right fielder of a baseball team as much as the triathlon who is more competing with him or herself, as you remarked, you can control yourself as they are competing as a part of something larger. Mm -hmm. Because as a PI as well, it's very competitive and you have a leadership role as a PI. You have a leadership role in your athletics. And I'm wondering where you're more to use, if we're gonna talk about the brain, more of an organismic perspective, if you're more the left hand, do you still have that same competitive spirit when you're not the brain, for example. Who wants to start, Pierre? Well, it's, uh, uh, it's an interesting comment. Actually, when we were at the brief chat before <laughs> yeah. this session, we, I mean, realized that the three of us in different domains and, and experiences, it's individuals. Sport. It's actually, I think, Ra said it uh, at some point, uh, you, it's, uh, you're competing against yourself, really. Um, and uh, in science, it's, it, it's both. I mean, you, you, have, you have your ideas, you want to test them, uh, you, you, you bring the resources to, to test. It's, it's uh, in a way, it's also something not against yourself, but I mean, it's something around your own vision. But at the same time, um, science is a community, and so you have to uh, interact and exchange. So. It, c it is in a lab. It's a team effort. You, 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 you obviously bring in many, many competences. So, I mean, there are analogies with these individual sports, with uh, uh, a PI uh, running a lab. Um, but I think it's more complex and more complete uh, in terms of uh, of science. It's not just you alone. It's you, your team, and your community. So it's it's both actually. Can I add to that? So, of course, of course. so I, com I climbed for a long time and I, it was, 
individual and a team sport, but I'm also a left and a beach volleyball player. I also play attacker and a beach volleyball player. And I noticed that the, the, more I am an, the more I have a good relationship with myself, I'm at peace with myself and I can handle myself, the more I can deal with my teammates. Because the best relationship in, and the longest relationship you have in your life is with yourself. So I always tell people to, to travel alone once, completely alone, to eat alone, to go to the movies alone, at least once in your life. Because if you're happy and content by yourself, you're at peace and balanced with who you are. You don't need distractions. You don't need something to, to fill a void that's missing in who you are. So absolutely, my mountaineering career has really helped my, my sports and my team sports and volleyball because it has taught me so much about being a team, team player and being a kind, good person because I, I had to deal with myself first <laughs> before I dealt with my teammates. So yes, it might be individual, but it hones you in a way that helps you be a team player because you can be an awesome solo but if you don't ha know how to deal with the rest of the world, then you'll be very alone. It's really important to learn how to deal with, with the rest of the world. No one lives in an island, although most men say so, but no, no one lives on an island. <laughs> Martin, your comment on this? Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I, I agree. For me, for me you know, science is team sports, yeah. period. And so I, I would expect that there are you know, uh, former uh, professional football, all of their basketball players who, let's say, quit, maybe having been injured at an early stage and became great scientists. It's mm. just more like a, I don't know, small data sample that we have here. I know of, of at least one um, very famous um, geologist, experimental geologist, uh, an Italian guy, Giulio Di Toro, who was a national, in a national team of volleyball. And uh, so he injured himself at age 25 or whatever, and then be you know you know discovered his other talent and nurtured that other, ta other talent to be a, a very uh, innovative geologist. So I think it's more like a data sample issue mm -hmm. yeah. today. Um, so in any case, you know the, the the physical activity and the mental requirements to be successful in sport are you know transferable to science and needed in science so there should be more such you know scientists out there who have a background in professional team sports and, and i'm sure they are yeah, i'm mm. sure being a team player is a skill as well yeah so sports teaches you that <laughs> thank you very much Good question. i think we have time for one last question um there, there's one the there's cube two. okay let's start here and Let's see if also we can mani maybe have the, the That's second a good one. question. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say to Raha that we are proud of you because uh, you are S Saudi women and also because uh, you proved them wrong. Thank you and so uh, much. Put your cube in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <right. laughs> Thank you. A question for the scientist. I would say that I am a scientist in progress, so I'm still working on I'm, it. I'm as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to ask you how do you balance these two words together because when I'm working out I feel guilty because I'm not spending time with my studies and when I am studying I feel, in, I feel guilty because I'm not putting time uh, to heal my body That's a good question. also I want to ask uh, how the working out and being an athlete how uh, it helped you as a scientist well Certainly, for a few years now, <laughs> I haven't played any competitive <laughs> sports, so uh, definitely my golf quality went down, and hopefully my science productivity <laughs> went up. So, uh, but I had this challenge, yes, when I was uh, in medical school, that's true, uh, because at that time I really needed to, to, to intensely train and uh, to also learn things uh, in the medical school, which I enjoyed very much. So I think it's a matter, uh, goes back to maybe one of my first comments, uh, uh, discipline and focus. So you, do, you organize yourself, you do one thing very intensely, not just you know, uh, thinking about other things. When you do one thing, you just do it well and intensely, and then turn the page, go and do something else. I think this is necessary at the competitive level. Now I play here. Once in a while, uh, no, well, not enough actually. Uh, uh, <laughs> I play some golf here, but 
I, I, I have to say I don't put the same intensity and focus mm. that I used to put uh, a few years ago. So, um, so the question really applies when you are in a, in a uh, at least again uh, regarding what I was doing in a competitive setting where you really have to perform. You can do it, but just organization, discipline, and focus. Mm. Martin. Yeah, um, I agree with Pierre, and I would add to this that. For me, the ability, or th as you said, you know, the the, the, the mm skill, no, no, the, the aspect of that we're so lucky to be able to do that, mm. right, to have a life as a professional, as a scientist, as a student, and be able to do sports. To me, this is actually a blessing, right? And so, I view the the possibility to be able to go do some sports in an evening as a reward. It's 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 actually good thing for me. It's the other Martin that can do something that he likes, enjoys, and actually keeps him mentally and physically healthy. And then, once I've done my sports on the weekend and early morning, right? Then I go back to work on the weekend and, and say, well, I did something for myself and now I focus on mm -hmm. work so I can separate the two and they're not competing with each other but they're actually, Helping. they belong together. They are both part of myself and they inf reinforce each other, right? I gain <coughs> rewards, strength, and motivation from doing the sports and then, you know, looking forward to get some work done and the other way around after a long day of work you say I really look forward to do my sports so I don't view this as a competition of either or uh, I view that the two belong together and um, you know keeping them in balance makes me a better me thank you uh, there was a last quick quick question can we uh, give the microphone not working the cube do we have the cube? Just toss it. Yeah, you can actually toss it. Toss it. I wouldn't do that. It <laughs> but I, I tell people to do it. The problem is the catching. Okay. It. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think now. Yes. So uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing very different perspectives and insights. Uh, my question is about failures. Uh, so whether it's a sport or it's a science, I mean, you have always failures. And how do you deal with that? How do you uh, overcome of that? In the sense, for example, one of the things is your brain says reward system. So you have something reward and you kind of have a motivation to restart the things. But I feel that reward system limits your creativity. Actually, if you have intrinsic motivation to do something, then probably you will overcome that failure in a nice, nicer way probably and you will do something more creative. Uh, but I mean, sometimes you have like given real life situations, challenges, mental and emotional conditions that you don't want to start something after failure. So how, how do you deal with all these things? Maybe the brain uh, yes, it's uh, the I'm, the I'm not sure I got the, the, <laughs> yes, the, it's, um, the question. I can take it. I can answer it. Okay, I think uh -huh, and if rewarding yourself doesn't work, just ask yourself what kind of person do you want to be? Do you want to be a person who gives up? because they failed or do you want to be a person that never gives up regardless of falling so if you if you're rewarding yourself doesn't help you just ask yourself honestly am i a failure because that's different than failing or am i a fighter and then decide which one you live with with the rest of your life i'm sorry to interrupt here very quickly <laughs> but we are running out of time <laughs> so <laughs> Thank you again very much to the panelists. Thank you to the people who join us here in the library. And oh, that's for us. Thank you also <laughs> to the people who are watching us online. Thank you, and I'll see you next time Shukran. for next Play Cafe. Thank you. <laughs>